Let's stop now and review. Here we see a picture of a motor neuron communicating with a single muscle cell. This functional contact is called a neuromuscular junction, or NMJ. A neuromuscular junction consists of five things. The neural cell membrane, the synaptic vesicles within the terminal bouton of the neuron, the synaptic cleft, the muscle cell membrane, and the receptors within the muscle cell membrane. It is this contact that allows a neuron to release a chemical signal, or neurotransmitter, on the muscle cell membrane. The part of the muscle cell that is in contact with the neuron is called the motor end plate. A motor end plate consists of the muscle cell membrane plus the acetylcholine receptors expressed there. Here is a picture of a neuromuscular junction. We see the yellow terminal bouton, or synaptic terminus, communicating with the motor end plate. Where the motor end plate invaginates is called the synaptic trough. The space between the terminal bouton of the neuron and the muscle cell membrane is called the synaptic cleft. And you can see that subneural clefts within the motor end plate are simply more invaginations of the muscle cell membrane. Their purpose is to increase the surface area of the motor end plate. This means more space to express the acetylcholine receptors. At the top of the subneural clefts, we would find acetylcholine ligand-operated receptors, and at the bottom of the subneural clefts, we would find voltage-operated sodium channels. Let's do it again. This picture is showing you an up-close version of a motor neuron communicating with a single muscle cell. The yellow motor neuron is releasing acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine is depicted here as blue dots. The acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft to bind to acetylcholine receptors found embedded within the muscle cell membrane. You'll notice that the muscle cell membrane has many smaller invaginations called subneural clefts. At the top of the subneural cleft, you would find acetylcholine receptors. The types of acetylcholine receptors found here are mostly nicotinic, but there are a few muscarinic acetylcholine receptors too. The difference between these two receptors will be covered extensively during lecture. When acetylcholine is released by the motor neuron, it diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to acetylcholine receptors found embedded in the muscle cell membrane. This leads to a gated channel being opened, and this now permits sodium to enter the muscle cell. As sodium enters the muscle cell, the membrane potential in this muscle cell will begin to rise. When the membrane potential rises enough, this will trigger voltage-gated sodium channels to also open. When voltage-gated sodium channels open, then more sodium is allowed to enter the muscle cell. Let's go over this again, this time focusing only on the synaptic terminus of a motor neuron. Shown here in blue is an outline drawing of the terminal bouton of a motor neuron. The green circles represent synaptic vesicles filled with acetylcholine. As an action potential travels down the axon, this causes the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. An increase in cytosolic calcium causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the neuron cell membrane. The acetylcholine, the synaptic vesicles, sorry, then ex exocytose the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft and the acetylcholine can now diffuse across the neuromuscular junction to bind to acetylcholine receptors on the muscle cell. With this slide, I'm going to graphically demonstrate what happens when the muscle fiber has been excited. Shown here is a picture of the subneural cleft. The squares represent nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and the circles represent voltage-operated sodium channels at the bottom of the subneural cleft. First, acetylcholine is released into the neuromuscular junction and binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the muscle cell membrane.
opening of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors shown here by this red arrow means that now sodium can diffuse into the muscle cytoplasm. This raises the membrane potential to a more positive or less negative millivoltage shown here with the second red arrow. This increase in membrane potential is called the end plate potential. The end plate potential will then trigger the opening of sodium voltage operated channels found deeper in the subneural cleft. Shown all together, we see that the binding of acetylcholine to a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor leads to the inside of the cell becoming more positive and this triggers the opening of voltage operated sodium channels. This is the action potential peak detected by a voltmeter. In order to end this process, acetylcholinesterase must degrade the acetylcholine. Now it's time to review the triad. Remember, in our previous PowerPoint segment, I described a triad as a T-tubule, the invagination of the cell membrane surrounded by the swollen ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. These swollen ends are called terminal cisterni. Connecting the surface of the muscle cell membrane with the terminal cisterni is a voltage sensor. When the action potential spreads down the T-tubule, this will trigger the opening of voltage-operated calcium channels on the surface of the terminal cisterni. The end result will be calcium leaving the sarcoplasmic reticulum to enter the sarcoplasm. This phase of muscle contraction is called excitation-contraction coupling. <clears throat> In this picture, you see a T-tubule. On the right side, you see a terminal cisterni attached to the T-tubule by voltage sensors. The green box structure above the terminal cisterni represents a sarcomere. The green lines representing the thin filaments and the black bar representing the thick filament. So, let's view excitation-contraction coupling. These events happen quickly, so let me describe them and then I'll start the movie for this slide. First, an action potential travels down the T-tubule. This means that the voltage-operated sodium channels are opening and the inside of the cell is becoming less negative. This triggers the opening of calcium voltage-operated channels on the terminal cisterni. The calcium inside is released and the calcium can now lead to the thin filaments sliding across the thick filament. Watch for the sarcomere to shorten. Meanwhile, a calcium ATPase is using active transport to pump the cytosolid calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to terminate contraction. Watch for the sarcomere to relax. Now I'll start the movie. Perhaps you need to go through the events again. Shown here is a single muscle cell with six myofibrils inside. On the right side of the picture, you see two transverse tubules surrounded by the terminal cisterni of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. First, let's cover the excitation phase of muscle contraction. A motor neuron will release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft of the neuromuscular junction. The acetylcholine diffuses to acetylcholine receptors expressed on the muscle cell membrane at the top of subneural clefts. Binding of acetylcholine opens these ligand operated channels and sodium diffuses into the cell and the influx of positive charges means the inside of the cell becomes less negative. This is called an end plate potential. This causes voltage-operated sodium channels at the bottom of a subneural cleft to open, increasing the influx of sodium and leading to an action potential. This action potential sweeps down T-tubules 
As it does so, this triggers voltage-operated calcium channels on the surface of the terminal cisternae to open. Releasing calcium marks the beginning of the excitation contraction phase, or latent period. As calcium channels open, the calcium levels within the cytoplasm rise and will lead to the final phase of muscle contraction. Let's do it again, but now add on the contraction phase in more detail. First, let's cover the excitation phase of muscle contraction. A motor neuron will release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft of the neuromuscular junction. The acetylcholine diffuses to acetylcholine receptors expressed in the muscle cell membrane at the top of subneural clefts. Binding of acetylcholine opens these ligand-operated channels and sodium diffuses into the cell and the influx of positive charges means the inside of the cell becomes less negative. This is an end plate potential. This causes voltage operated sodium channels at the bottom of a subneural cleft to open, increasing the influx of sodium and leading to an action potential. This action potential sweeps down T tubules. As it does so, this triggers voltage operated calcium channels on the surface of the terminal cisternae to open, which is the beginning of the excitation contraction phase. As calcium channels open, the calcium levels within the cytoplasm rise. The calcium within the cytoplasm can now bind to troponin. You'll remember that this protein is part of the thin filament and binds to both actin and tropomyosin. When troponin binds calcium, this causes a conformational change in tropomyosin so that it can no longer block actin's binding sites. This concludes the excitation contraction coupling or latent period. Now we begin the contraction phase. A myosin head is already cocked in a high energy conformation state so that when actin is exposed it swings its heads up and binds to actin. The heads of myosin now swivel and pull the thin filaments across the thick filament. This is called the power stroke. At the end of the power stroke a new ATP molecule binds to myosin and myosin detaches from actin. The myosin ATPase will cleave the ATP and the energy released will cause the myosin head to recock, much like setting up a catapult to hurl a large boulder. This cycle of caulking, binding, power stroke, slumping, and recocking occurs over and over as long as the neuron continues to excite the muscle cell and calcium is in the cytoplasm to keep tropomyosin off actin. As the thin filaments are pulled toward the center of the sarcomere, the eye bands narrow and may even disappear. I would like to go over the steps of contraction. Again, when the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium, the calcium diffuses and binds with troponin. When troponin binds calcium, this causes a conformational change in tropomyosin so that it can no longer black block actin's binding sites for myosin cross bridges. Let's start at step 4 on the left of this picture. The myosin heads are already cocked in a high energy conformation so that when actin is exposed it swings its heads up and binds to actin, shown in step 1. The heads of myosin now swivel and pull the thin filaments across the thick filament. This is called the power stroke, shown in step 2. At the end of the power stroke, the myosin heads bind a new ATP and as they do so, they detach or slump, shown in step 3. The myosin ATPase will cleave the ATP and the energy released will cause the myosin head to recock. This cycle of caulking, binding, power stroke, slumping, and recocking occurs over and over as long as the neuron continues to excite the muscle cell and calcium, also, is in the cytoplasm to keep tropomyosin off actin. As the thin filaments are pulled toward the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line, the eye bands narrow and may even disappear.
On the previous slide, you viewed a close-up picture of the thin and thick filaments and their interactions during contraction. This slide is showing you what the sarcomere is doing during contraction. The shortening of the sarcomere, shown at the bottom of this slide, is due to the sliding action of interdigitating actin and myosin filaments. Look at the relaxed sarcomere first. Notice the length of the A-band. The A-band consists of the thick filaments plus a portion of the thin filaments where they overlap. The I-band consists only of thin filaments that are found on either side of the Z-disc. The H-zone consists of only thick filaments. Notice no interdigitating thin filaments are found here. In the contracted state, the thin filaments have been pulled toward the center of the sarcomere, and the I-bands have narrowed, and the H-zone has almost disappeared. In order to relax the muscle and have the muscle return to its original length, the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft must be destroyed by acetylcholine esterase. Additionally, the neuron that released the acetylcholine needs to stop firing action potentials and stop releasing the acetylcholine. Next, the calcium in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell must be re-sequestered within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This requires the calcium ATPase, a protein pump in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that uses ATP in order to move calcium from the cytosol into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Additionally, ATP is needed in order to break the interaction between actin and myosin. However, ATP is not hydrolyzed until the cocking of the myosin heads for the next contraction. There are two primary categories of muscle fiber types, slow red or fast white. First notice that if we triggered a slow red muscle fiber to contract, no matter how many times we stimulated it, it would maintain the same force in contraction over time. In contrast, shown here in blue, if we stimulated fast white muscle fibers, over time the white muscle fibers would, would fatigue and generate a less forceful contraction, shown here as a decline in contraction force. Slow red fibers are also called oxidative because they rely on oxidative phosphorylation to generate most of their ATP. In order to do this, they must have many mitochondria, have a rich blood supply or capillary density, and a lot of myoglobin. Myoglobin is a protein within muscle fibers that binds and stores oxygen. Plus, these fibers tend to be small in diameter and have slow cross-bridge cycling. In contrast, fast white fibers are called glycolytic. They are usually large in diameter because these cells have accumulated a lot of cytoplasmic proteins involved in glycolysis. They also lack robust myoglobin, capillary beds, and mitochondria. Because glycolysis doesn't generate a lot of ATP, this means that over time, the muscle cells will lose their ability to sustain a forceful contraction. In animals, the relative proportions of fibers that are type 1 can be altered by exercise regimes, but the changes are not permanent. Exercise can, however, influence the biochemical capacities of muscle. For example, aerobic exercise can increase capillary density, myoglobin content, and the number of mitochondria. This creates improvement in performance and fatigue resistance. There will also be similar changes to the capacity of the cardiovascular system. In trained athletes, it appears that performance is ultimately limited by the pulmonary system. The ability to supply oxygen to the muscles is the limiting factor. Let's summarize the difference between fast glycolytic white fibers and slow oxidative red fibers. First, let's address their fiber size. 
Slow red fibers are smaller in diameter and fast white are larger in diameter. Slow red fibers are called oxidative fibers because they primarily generate ATP through a process that is aerobic. In other words, they use oxidative phosphorylation. In order to do this, they must have a continuous supply of oxygen. Their blood supply is very robust and they also have a high amount of myoglobin, the protein within a muscle cell that can bind and store oxygen. Fast white fibers, however, are considered anaerobic. They generate ATP through an anaerobic process called glycolysis. They, therefore, have a less robust blood supply and a lower amount of myoglobin. The rate at which the myosin ATPase, found in the myosin heads, cycles between a caulking and recocking state also varies between the two muscle fiber types. Fast white means that this rate of cycling occurs very quickly compared to the slow red fiber type. Examples of these types of fibers can be found in your own body. The muscle right now in your erector spiny muscle group are primarily of the slow oxidative red fiber type. They can sustain a longer contraction over time, keeping you seated in your chair. However, I'm sure you have experienced times during an exam, perhaps when you are writing an essay, when the muscles in your hands became fatigued. Perhaps you put down your pencil and shaked your hand a bit. Your intrinsic hand muscles, in fact, are composed of primarily fast white glycolytic fibers. A new study has suggested that when a gene called PGC1-beta was expressed in mouse muscle, the muscle fibers were converted to an intermediate type. Fast fibers that are resistant to fatigue are sometimes called intermediate. These mice, can, these mice ran 25% longer and covered 45% more distance on a treadmill compared to littermates that did not express this gene.